Derek Splone, glad to be alongside Chicago's very own Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm doing terrific, thank you. So, let's jump right into it, Isaiah. You grew up on the west side of Chicago. How did that mold you into the person you are today? Um, you know, the values and the lessons learned uh, growing up on the west side of Chicago, uh, the family that I grew up in, um, you know, it was all about education. That was the thing that was preached the most in our household. That was the word around the community uh, at that time. Uh, it was all about uh, striving to get better uh, through education, not necessarily through athletics. And you're very passionate about giving back to the community. You founded the Mary's Court Foundation named after your mother to help improve the lives of disadvantaged women and families. How have you been able to continue to use basketball as a tool to show the youth that anything is possible? Well, you know, when you, when you have an opportunity to be in the spotlight uh, as I've been over you know, a long period of time, uh, you try to use that platform to shine a light on others. Uh, then you have to help support others and give them a pathway to success and give them a pathway out of their tough circumstances. So what I've always tried to do with uh, the platform of sport or celebrity is to uh, try to help others and try to shine light on others. Absolutely. Did you kind of have that as well when you were growing up? Someone to kind of mentor you to get you? Uh, you know, just again, it was it was the neighborhood, um, my family, my brothers. Uh, I played for great coaches. Right. Um, so all my coaches were uh, went to the Hall of Fame. My high school coach, Gene Pingator, is in the Hall of Fame. My college coach, Bob Knight, is in the Hall of Fame. My pro coach, Chuck Daly, made it to the Hall of Fame. And I made it to the Hall of Fame. So that says that I I was lucky enough to have great coaching, great parenting, and just you know a great community that, that kind of helped me. Absolutely, and many people refer to Chicago as the murder capital of the country. What do you believe is the solution to the violence? Well, we have to address the issues of poverty. Capitalism says that there's always going to be poverty. However, um, when you put drugs and weapons on top of poverty, uh, then you have no chance. Um, historically, we, we've shown that you can educate uh, in poverty. Uh, you can have good family, good values in poverty. However, uh, what makes it almost impossible is when you put drugs and weapons on top of that. So if we can find a way to eradicate or eliminate drugs and weapons out of impoverished areas, uh, then I think we've come a long way. That's a great point. And now on to the basketball, your start of your career. When did you first discover your love for the game? I always loved the game. Um, it was a game that um, my family and I, my brothers and I, we, we always played. And, you know, we were like most kids. We were seasonal. You know, yeah. when it was football season, we played football, basketball, we played basketball, baseball. But, you know, once I got to high school, basketball more or less took over in terms of what I wanted to play and focus on. Uh, I enjoyed watching the other sports, but my passion became basketball. And you played your high school basketball at St. Joseph's under Coach Pingatore, as you yeah. stated. What have you been able to learn from him and that kind of molded you into the player you are? Again, the, the, the old school coaches, they were more philosophical coaches. Yeah. Uh, they, they were value-based coaches and uh, they believed that, you know, their job was to build the person mm -hmm. and the player will come. And, more or less give you the life skills to assimilate in the community, uh, not necessarily uh, become the best basketball right. player to play NBA basketball and all that. So uh, those are the things that I learned from my coaches, uh, you know, how to take care of your personhood. And an interesting quote that I found was after a game in high school, after an interview, you asked Coach Pingator, am I different? Am I becoming different? You have to let me know. I don't want to be different. I want to be the same. Well, there's some heartfelt questions. How did Coach Pingator respond? You know, his, his response was basically, you know, I'll let you know if that starts to happen or if I see changes. Um, you know, because too many times when you're, when you're thrown into the spotlight, yeah. uh, you know, the media is covering you, you get newspaper clippings, you're on television and everything else. And there's a gradual change in all of us that, that occurs. And sometimes you don't recognize those changes, whether they be positively or negatively. So he being a coach in my life at that time, uh, I wanted to make sure that um, if he saw any of the negative things happening, that we try to address them quickly. And moving on to your collegiate career, you played at Indiana University under Bob Knight. What was the number one thing you were, took away from Bob Knight that you were able to transition into the next level? Uh, again, 
uh, from my high school yeah. coach, my mom, and everybody else, just just being prepared, mm -hmm. uh, being prepared, and taking the time to to study. If you want to A on a test, uh, you really have to, you know, you have to study. Yeah. You just don't show up and get an A on a test. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we we spent a lot of time uh, preparing, understanding the opponent. Um, strengths, weaknesses, um, how to dismantle opponents, uh, how to dismantle team philosophy. So it's, uh, you know, we learned a lot of uh, basketball from him, but it was an additional block of the building block that uh, my mom and my high school coaches right. and my grade school coaches had already started. So I was lucky to just be in one school of thought, one school of philosophy in terms of play, in personhood. And it must have been awesome because you won a national championship there as well, so I'm sure the attention buzzed off a little bit more at Indiana at least. So. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, fellow Chicagoan and future teammate Mark Aguirre goes number one in the NBA draft. You go number two, 1981 NBA draft. Take us through draft night and uh, your thoughts when you heard your name called by the commissioner. Well, it was, it was very surreal in terms of uh, your life drastically changed and it changed in an instant. Um, you went from uh, living below the poverty line and not being able to afford a meal, literally. And, and in 24 hours, you can buy your family meals. Yeah. So it was uh, definitely was a life-changing experience. Um, that night, um, I remember the most, you know, Mark and I just really making it a family moment. It was really all about our families, mm -hmm. our moms, our dads, our brothers, our sisters. Um, you know, it was it was all night, yeah. and uh, it was it was a good night. How long did it kind of take you though to adjust to knowing like you know one day you're a college athlete, then all of a sudden you're a professional basketball player? It didn't take me long to adjust um, to that because I had um, I had good friends. Um, you know, Magic was um, you know very influential uh, at that time to me. George Gervin, Dr. J. So there was a brotherhood that I that I more or less uh, went into and. Uh, they took time with Mark right. and I over the summer to basically tell us what the NBA was going to be about and what we were going into. That's fantastic. Then. And Isaiah, you helped lead the Pistons to two championships back-to-back -back during an era when the powerhouses were the, uh, the Celtics and the Lakers, and you also had the emergence of the Bulls and the Trailblazers. But what did it mean to you to bring those multiple championships back to a city like Detroit that was hungering for something positive? That, that was great because that, that was, uh, as you said, it was a city that was hungry for something positive, and we were able to provide that light, uh, provide that, that, that positivity to, you know, families, uh, people who were struggling, people who were having a, a very difficult time in their lives, and you were able to bring some sunshine and a ray of hope that uh, things can and will get better. Right. So um, that was a, a dual combination of winning on the court and also winning off the court. And Isaiah, despite your talent, many players conspired to keep you off of the dream team. How did you overcome that obstacle? You know, you just, you just move on. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you do the best you can with what you have, and uh, your job is not to evaluate yourself. You are evaluated by others in this profession. So my job was to present my body of work, do it as well as I can, and then someone else decides if they like it or not. So You did fantastic, 12-time All-Star, two-time world champion, and a Hall of Famer. You were also the all-time leading scorer in Pistons franchise history. When you look back at your journey, what stands out the most to you about those accolades? The two championships. Yeah. Uh, win winning back-to-back -back championships in the era that we won championships in, because the teams were so stacked, the players were so good, and um, you know our journey to a championship, I don't know if there's ever been a, a tougher journey to a championship than the one we had to take uh, through those um, you know, great players and great teams. Well, after your playing career, you still managed to stay in the game, most notably as a coach. What was the biggest challenge you faced, though, having to adjust from playing the game to coaching the game? From a coaching standpoint, um, you, you realize uh, quickly it's, um, you know, if you, if you have great players, you have a great coach. If you have good players, you have a good coach. Uh, and the players do, if you, if you really have, you know, it's a player's game. And while you were playing, you understood it was a player's game. 
But when you start coaching, you know it's a yeah. player's game. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a better understanding a little bit than yeah, when you hit. Because it's, you know, as Coach Knight uh, said one time, he said, just imagine that the guy that you're coaching is running up and down the court with your paycheck in his mouth. Yeah. And it depends on whether that guy makes the shot or misses the shot if you're a good or a bad coach. Oh, that's a, that's a perfect <laughs> example. <laughs> and just a couple more questions for you. What was your reaction to the comments made by Los Angeles Clippers owner Donald Sterling in regards to African Americans and in particular Magic Johnson? I think that was, a, that was and it has been a very turbulent time uh, for the NBA and society in general. Um, however, what, it, what it's done is open the door for a broader conversation on race relations in this country. Um, the language that we use, the racialization of, of, of how we treat each other. Uh, I think it's, it's opened the door for us to have these type of conversations that were dormant for so long. And the history of this country uh, with racism, um, it, it, it impels you to, to basically act when you have these type of words being talked about from an owner of a team right. who has power and who also um, governs and represent a sport that we try to take across globally where we transport our culture, uh, we, cr we transport our thoughts, we transport who we are. And sports is the place where you supposedly have a level playing field. So anytime this conversation is within the boundaries of sport, it has to be rooted out quickly. And the NBA and the players have done a good job in doing that. My final question for you, Isaiah. Many great basketball players have came out of Chicago, guys like Dwayne Wade and Derrick Rose, among uh, many others. But what's your reaction when people tell you, Isaiah, you're the greatest basketball player to come out of Chicago? I, you know, I, I take it as a huge compliment. Uh, I don't necessarily uh, embrace it. Okay. Uh, because, as you said, there, there's been so many, so many great ones that have come out of the city. Uh, so what I just try to do is be happy to stand on right. the stage with everyone. Uh, but to single me out as, as the best, um, I, I don't necessarily accept it, but I'm honored that people would say that. You know, the thing that I do embrace, though, is that you look at the players that have come out of Chicago, particularly the ones in my era that I grew up with, all of us went on to win championships yeah, in the NBA. That's true. Uh, myself, Mark Aguirre, Eddie Johnson, Doc Rivers recently just joined the club. Uh, you had Daryl Walker, Craig Hodges, Rod Higgins. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us, you know, won championships, you know, and then you, you go to the next generation and you look at the Antoine Walkers, the Dwayne Wades, uh, the people who have continued to come and rise out of Chicago who, who wear the championship ring. So I don't, I don't know if in the last uh, 20 years there's been a team that's won a championship that hasn't had someone from Chicago on it or some type of Chicago connection. We even claim Tony Parker because his oh, yeah. dad's from Chicago. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Derek Splone, Isaiah Thomas, I appreciate your time so much. Thank, Thank you. you.